Okay, uh, first of all, well, let me know if I'm speaking too close to the microphone and it's too loud, because sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Um, second of all, thank you very much for organizing this workshop and also for letting me uh, present my work here today. I'm gonna talk about the work that I've been doing during my PhD with uh, Cristina on supernova neutrinos and neutrino non-radiative decay. Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. Um, I'm going to start by explaining what supernova neutrinos are and how we can describe them. Then I will move on and, and explain what we consider, what kind of process we are considering when we talk about neutrino non-radiative decay and the different uh, cases that we are considering. And lastly, I will give the results that we had obtained. Um, in relation to supernova 1987a, we were able to extract limits on the lifetime to mass ratio of neutrinos, and for the DSMB flux, um, we obtain uh, predictions for uh, future observations. Oh, I have this. Yeah, so, okay, let's start with the supernova neutrinos. Um, so when a massive star dies, its core collapses, and then it can explode uh, in a supernova and end up forming a neutron star, or this explosion can fail and it recollapses back into a black hole. However, the outcome during this uh, process a lot of neutrinos are emitted, and actually 99% of the gravitational binding energy of the star is released as neutrinos. So since neutrinos then uh, travel to Earth and perturbed and ignoring everything, if we detect these neutrinos, we can extract interesting information, both about the explosion dynamics of the supernova and also about properties of neutrinos that as a particle physicist is what I care about. Um, okay. Yeah, the problem is that we are only sensitive to galactic supernovae, and these are very rare event, about one to three per century, and there has only been one detection of these supernova neutrinos. This was the detection of supernova 1987A, which is located 50 kiloparsecs away in a satellite galaxy. Um, from this supernova, only 24, 24 events were detected by Kamiokande 2, IMB, and Baxan, which if we where if we had a supernova nowadays, we were able to, to extract many more events than what they did back in the days. But luckily, we have another way of detecting neutrinos coming from supernova, and this is the diffuse supernova neutrino background, or the SMB. This the SMB is the flux of all the neutrinos and antineutrinos that were emitted uh, by, by all past core collapses in the observable universe. It hasn't been detected yet, but these are the current upper limits set by different experiments. And uh, from super the data uh, before the added gadolinium, uh, we have the most stringent limit for the electron antineutrino flux. Recently in neutrino 2024, uh, the new results of the search of the DSMB uh, with super were released, um, adding the two new phases that uh, contain gadolinium. And this is, if I'm not uh, mistaken, this is the model dependent analysis in which they uh, found a 2.3 sigma excess over the background hypothesis only. But anyway, if you wanna know more about this and you're still here next week, uh, Toma will speak and talk more about this. Well, now let's, uh, let me describe more in detail how can we uh, parameterize the uh, neutrino emission from a single collapse. This neutrino emission de uh, depends on different uh, uh, things like the outcome of the collapse, if it's a neutron star, a black hole, et cetera, and also on progenitor characteristics. I made, uh, for instance, on the progenitor mass, which I made explicit here. Um, okay. So neutrinos are produced here in the core and they are trapped there until they reach densities, uh, lower densities, and then they can start streaming, start free streaming at the surface that we're gonna call the neutrino sphere. At this point, uh, we can parameterize this flux, the flux. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, that looks like this one. And it depends on three parameters, the luminosity, the average energy, and a parameter. The luminosity for each uh, neutrino flavor is around 10 to the 52 ergs. Um, for the average energies with the typical energies are between nine and 18 mega electron volts. 
Okay, so once the neutrinos are emitted at the neutrino sphere, they still have to propagate through matter until they reach the surface of the supernova. And there is this propagation, they can uh, experience different flavor effects. And these flavor effects inside the supernovae are still under study. There are uh, many things that could affect. And if you're interested, you can check Christina's uh, review that was published like a week ago, I think. Um, but anyway, for our work, we had only considered the well-established MSW effect, and we have considered this one to be adiabatic. Uh, for the DSMB flux, as we are considering the, all, the emission of all the neutrinos and antineutrinos from all collapses in the universe, we have to integrate over redshift. And also we have to take into account the expansion of the universe in we're considering uh, normal lambda CDN model. And also we have to consider the redshift of the energies. Um, the next term of this expression is the supernova rate that it's proportional to the star formation rate. And actually from, from the normalization of, normalization of the supernova rate, we obtain one of the largest uncertainties of the DSNB flux. Lastly, we have the, the last term in this expression, which is the neutrino emission from a single collapse that I just explained. And I say, as I mentioned before, this depends on the outcome of the, of the collapse. Either we have a neutron star or a black hole. And actually, the fraction of collapses that end up forming a black hole, it's still a debated issue. Uh, the, the value is not well known. And for that reason, uh, we had considered three different uh, values for this fraction of black holes. In this scheme, uh, we show the different regions. In purple are the regions of masses that will end up forming a neutron star, and in blue, the regions of masses, the ranges of masses for which the collapse will end up forming a black hole. Um, yeah, and with this, we obtain uh, these uh, results, these flux for the, elect the electron antineutrino flux on Earth, and we can see the, dif the difference between the three different fraction of black holes that I just mentioned before. Um, as we can see, the larger, the larger the fraction of black hole is, the larger the flux is at the high energy tail of the flux, which is the most interesting uh, for detection. And the blue band, as I uh, shows the 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 uncertainty coming from the supernova rate normalization that I mentioned before. Um, okay. Uh, the results for the integrated flux are shown here, and we can also see that, again, with a larger fraction of black holes, we obtain a larger uh, integrated flux. Okay. But we are interested in knowing how neutrino non-radiative decay can affect uh, this, the flux of these supernova neutrinos. And what we are considering is a process like this one, in which we have an active neutrino that decays into a lighter but also active neutrino or antineutrino, plus another scalar, scalar or pseudo-scalar particle that is very light. This is the only thing that we care about particle. Um, in this figure, I show the sensitivities to the lifetime to mass ratio for different experiments. And as we can see, supernova neutrinos and the DSMB flux are sensitive to larger values of the lifetime to mass ratio. And this is because then neutrinos have to well, uh, longer distances. In particular, the DSMB flux has a unique sensitivity to this kind of decay in this range. And this sensitivity and, and the effect of neutrino non radiative decay on the DSMB flux was studied before in several uh, works. But in our work, it's the first time that we include a three neutrino framework plus a detailed astrophysical model. And also, we consider both normal ordering and inverted ordering. And also in normal ordering, we uh, differentiate between two different regions, the region of quasi-degenerate masses and the region of strongly hierarchical masses. This leaves us with these decay, pa decay patterns that are the ones that we are considering in our work. Um, here we have the different assumptions that we made on the lifetime to mass ratio and the branching ratio. For the lifetime to mass ratio, we just considered that all the decay in eigenstates have the sa same value for tau over m. Um, for the branching ratio, uh, we considered a democratic decay. Okay, so to the results. For supernova 1987a, we performed uh, likelihood analysis of the data in order to extract limits for uh, tau over m. What we found is that in normal ordering, there's no sensitivity to this kind of decay. But 
in inverted ordering, we were able to extract lower limits for tau over m. And in particular, at 90% confidence level, we obtain that lifetime to mass ratio has to be larger than 1.2 times 10 to the 5 seconds per electron volt. This is one of the most ancient uh, limits. It uh, improves with respect to the limits ex um, obtained from experiments at Earth and also from solar neutrino data and astrophysical, high en energy astrophysical data. Only because uh, the, the limits from cosmology improve this, but Yvonne will tell us more about this uh, in the next session. Okay. Okay, so I mentioned before that the DSMB flux hasn't been discovered yet. Uh, so how can we detect this? So for the electron antineutrino flux, um, we, can we can detect this flux with, uh, with inverse beta decay. And this is the main channel used in supercambium candeplas gadolinium, which is already running and already uh, released some results. And then hypercambium candium juno uh, will also use this uh, main detection channel to, to, to detect the DSMB flux. Um, for the electron neutrino flux, uh, the Dune experiment will be able to detect it through neutrino absorption in liquid argon. Um, okay, now let me give you the predictions that we made for uh, the detection of the DSMB flux. First, in normal ordering, um, here are the four experiments that I just mentioned. Uh, these three uh, are sensitive to the electron antineutrino flux and due to the electron neutrino flux. And the first thing that we can see is that there's a similar behavior for all of these experiments. So let's just focus on supercambium and the plus gadolinium. And what we can see here is that in the case of strongly hierarchical masses, this green line, we have a complete degeneracy between the case of PK and the case of D. However, when we consider quasi-degenerate masses, uh, and we include neutrino decay, we now have an enhancement of the number of events, and this is due to an enhancement of the electron antineutrino flux. But on the contrary, when we consider inverted ordering, now we see a suppression, a complete a suppression of the flux, and this suppression is complete for lifetime to mass ratios of 10 to the 9 seconds per electron volt. So, well, uh, let me just summarize and conclude. Uh, we have performed an investigation of neutrino non radiative decay and its effect on supernova neutrinos. And for that, we, we have used a three neutrino framework and we have considered both normal ordering and inverted ordering. For supernova 1987A, with our likelihood analysis, we were able to extract limit, limits uh, for this tau over M in the case of inverted ordering. And in the case of the DSMB flux, we included for the first time this three neutrino framework plus a detailed astrophysical model. And yeah, we saw we obtained in normal ordering uh, a complete degeneracy when we consider strongly hierarchical masses, but we saw an enhancement of the flux and number of events when considering quasi-degenerate masses. On the contrary, as I just mentioned, for inverted ordering, we see a complete suppression of the number of events. Thank you very much. Do we have questions or comments? So Seth here. So, so how is stable are your results with respect to uh, flux uncertainties? Sorry? How stable are your results with respect to flux of, uncertainties? Of the DSNB flux uh, or? Yeah, basically. But also, yeah, but also for the, the 87 well, So for the DSMB flux, uh, so the behavior, it's it's what it is, and it regardless of the of the uncertainties of the flux, we would see uh, an enhancement of the flux if we have quasi degenerate masses and a suppression in inverted ordering. That that behavior would stay like that. However, you can see here already this I didn't mention, but these bands. Uh, only include the uh, the uncertainty from the supernova rate normalization, but there's still a, a very large uncertainty on the fractional black holes, also on different simulations of supernova yeah, give different that, results. That is, that is what I mean. How how stable is this sustain all these statements with respect to barring the the spectral shape of the fluxes? For the DSMB flux, the number of events will change. Uh, in the case of supernova 1987A, this is 
less model dependent in a way because we also um, consider the lumin we fit the luminosity energy. So we didn't use uh, specific uh, results for for trauma simulation. I don't know if Christina wants to add something. Yeah, what this Pilar is saying is uh, correct. Uh, first of all, the behaviors we saw in the DSMB, okay, we didn't implement also the uncertainty on the fluxes because then it, be, it, it became really, uh, I mean, uh, it, it was part of it, but uh, we put it aside, but what the, because of time, but uh, the trend that is shown for a given set of uh, one dimensional fluxes from the Garching group remains because it depends on the decay um, patterns. And therefore, even if you take another flux from another group, you will still see, as Pilar was saying, an enhancement for the normal ordering and strongly hierarchical quadrature. Yeah, it's an enhancement or a or suppression with respect to the no decay case. And therefore, it comes from the kinetic equations. So, so, yeah, so the... So the message there is that if you take a set of simulations and you, you have no decay or decay, in the case of normal ordering, you will see important degeneracies between the no decay and the decay case for different values of tau over m, so in the window where it's sensitive, and in inverted ordering, you would see a strong suppression in case of uh, with respect to the no decay. So the suppression would stay. Even if you take another set, you would get that the flux of uh, the the flux of neutrinos would get suppressed by the decay in the inverted ordering. And in normal ordering, you would have degeneracies, important degeneracies. Is so it, this will stay. It's a, it's. A, yeah, it's. We, It could, yeah, it could. Then, yeah, then sure. Then you, you you might still have also the genesis with fluxes from other simulations. Yes, yes, that in, that is indeed the, the object of a subsequent work, including all the, also that part. And concerning the supernova, but the trend stays. That's that's the main message that uh, we could eventually not see the DSMB because of decay, in inverted ordering. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Although, if you are in the extremes, uh, like for the the, the least, um, uh, the most conservative ones, then uh, such a suppression, because it's by several factors, would not be mimicked by other fluxes. Okay. So, if you are in the extreme cases, that then no. And for that, as uh, Pilar was saying, this is, uh, um, we can say, almost a, a model independent analysis because uh, we only have priors, and the priors are, uh, cover a range from uh, actual uh, realistic or detailed simulations. We are not taking a set of models. We are only taking priors on the flux parameters, which reflect our current knowledge of, uh, of supernova emission, neutrinos from uh, Neutrino emission from supernovae. So this is a, a model independent analysis. And by the way, she didn't say, but this is what has been included in the review of particle physics. Uh, for a certain fact, we also had an analysis uh, on uh, diffuse neutrino supernova mm -hmm. ground, uh, very similar. And, uh, but we also include this kind of uh, the uncertainty that uh, Sergio pointed out. Uh, um, in the following manner. So th there was, in fact, a paper of by Fukushita long ago where uh, he said that since uh, for, the, for this diffuse and neutrino background, uh, you need the high energy tail of the, of the supernova, the most useful uh, data from supernova is IMB, which is a standard type energy. And this is a number. So our number instead uh, uses the whole 
data with uh, some, uh, let's say, model, like, uh, say, Lambeloredo with many parameters. is uh, similar, I think, maybe uh, very similar. And uh, we include both the uncertainty on the rate of supernova production in, in of, of uh, say, star production and uh, supernova in the universe. And uh, we fluctuate uh, within, uh, let's say, the, the uncertainty, the, the, the parameter. No? So in a sense, the, our flux fluctuate. And the two uncertainty are comparable. I mean, uh, the uncertainty in the, from, say, from, uh, uh, cosmological distribution and the uncertainty that we have from the data of supernova 87 class model are having a comparable effect on expectation. Well, that's Absolutely, all of them. So somehow we fluctuate oh, so, them fully. So maybe I comment on your comment, uh, but that work doesn't include decay. No, 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 but decay. this work is about decay. Yeah. Is about neutrino non radiative decay. And by the way, there are, it's not, not only yours, but indeed there are several works that have included both the, the uncertainties on the evolving co collapse supernova rate and also the fluxes. I mean, oh, this, I this mean, is, you, no, but just saying that uh, what uh, Pilar uh, described is uh, really focused on neutrino non radiative decay. And so what we did is really the, the most detailed and uh, uh, for the moment analysis, including. Uh, uncertainties also, not from the fluxes yet, but uh, okay, so, so just to complement what you, yeah, I just, yeah. yeah, it's a different study, this is what I mean. Absolutely, yeah, we use the, the hypothesis, the supernova 87 is not uh, completely not standard, basically. So somehow, and this is a hypothesis. Do we have any more questions or comments? So I, I get the, all the discussions regarding the systematics in the supernova modeling in terms of two things. One is the astrophysical rates. The other one is the different subtypes of supernova and then the emission spectra. There's all the mm -hmm. time evolution, all that, right? So you are, after some very non-standard physics, uh, and uh, there's supposed to be some modeling telling you how tau name are related in some kind of specific model. Are there any kind of a you know kind of smoking gun signature just due to this type of effect, non reduced decay related to the mass, which will show up in these signals no matter what? You're just using supernova neutrinos as a source, as a less sensitivity to all the detail. Are there any such things? Uh. For example, if you go to some different regime, right? I mean, let's say, forget about the, the known 87A, and then there's mm -hmm. also the unknown, you know, some kind of sum up everything together in, in a diffuse kind of a context. If you look in some regime, are there some still unexplored private space and you combine them in tau over M, right? Let's say that I separate them. And there is a mass, there is a tau, uh, the neutrino, uh, basically, if they travel long distances, the mass definitely obviously will cause some delay in the, in the signal, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say that in the future, there's some supernova in, in a far away distance give you some significant delay because of the mass. And that will be, for example, energy dependent. The more energetic uh, neutrinos will, you know, arrive sooner, right? I'm sorry that I didn't get out. No. I didn't, didn't hear. Federica, yeah, talked about it yesterday. Yeah, but yeah. I thought that those sort of things are much more systematic in terms of the particle property law, right? You don't need it in the supernova conservative in there. I'm just looking for a very specific kind of a signal tied to the mass only. I'm only using the supernova neutrinos as a source. That's it. Right. So, I mean, the only thing that I could think about is that like in the case of inverted ordering, as we saw for the DSME flux, there's a possibility that this, the it decays completely. So we wouldn't see something that would be not model dependent on, on the supernova fluxes because it's basically, you don't see anything, but could also be if due to other standard physics things. So, uh, well, I, I can comment one other thing, of course, which is uh, you have these energy distributions. So if your energy distribution has features in it, it would be very hard to have that come from some astrophysical source. 
So for example, we also heard about these uh, very, very long wavelength oscillations. So if you happen to have a very long wavelength oscillation where it leaves a, a, a well-defined feature in your spectrum, uh, then you're in business. And, and that gives you uh, sensitivity to a very narrow range of parameters. So, so you know, they can't be too large or they can't be too small, but that's the other way. So as you're saying, timing is good. What they're saying is also, if you see nothing, that's kind of good, but I mean, good, but bad. <laughs> it, it means that you can't be that wrong that you see zero. And then of course, if you have any feature that distorts your spectrum in, a, in an unusual way, mm -hmm. that would be a sign of, of uh, physics, yeah. So uh, the discussion also with Carlos, now that there are these models where, where you have uh, this uh, new uh, kind of vacuum oscillation, no? And uh, I mean, we had a model which is uh, different in, uh, say, structure of the matrix with the same phenomenology, no? We pointed out something crazy, just, just to make, uh, say, discussion more spicy. I mean, you could, you could have even the contrary. If you have a mirror supernova to explode, you see signal of neutrino, you don't see any right. counterpart. I mean, just for fun. I mean, I, I don't believe in that. I wrote the paper and I don't believe in that. But, but, yeah. Any more comments or questions? So we should thank uh, Pilar again. And do we?